Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about one of the important uh, arrhythmias, tachyarrhythmia, that is atrial fibrillation. We might have learned in our MBBS days that it is an irregularly irregular rhythm. We will see what is this irregularly irregular rhythm. You can see here, whenever there is atrial fibrillation, normally when uh, our heart uh, produces impulses from SA node, one impulse that will go to the AV node. From there, the same impulse will be conducted to ventricle. So, one T wave from atria, that will produce one QRS complex from ventricle. Then this QRS complex come regularly, that is a sinus rhythm. But whereas in atrial fibrillation, atria beats in a rate of 350 to 600 beats per minute. So, it is around 600 beats per minute instead of 60 to 70, it is 10 times more. So, what happens uh, 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 when the beats are very high from atrium, all these beats will never go to the ventricle. If it goes like that, the ventricle rate will be 600 and patient will go to failure and death. So, body has a mechanism to block this unwanted tachyarrhythmia and at AV nodal junction or somewhere near to that, the uh, the conduction will be regulated. So, around 100 to 140 or 160 may go to the ventricle in a irregularly irregular fashion. That is why you are not seeing a regular P wave, some wavy baselines are seen. Then RR interval is totally irregular. Whenever there is a QRS complex is forming in the ECG, you are getting a pulse. That is why the pulse also will be irregularly irregular. So, wavy baseline that means P waves are not recordable or they are very small to get a proper P wave and QRS complex are irregularly irregular that is atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter is something like atrial fibrillation but the rate is low and is more regular. You can see the uh, sawtooth appearance of P waves. We are not going to that now. We are only discussing about atrial fibrillation at present. Now, you can see here normally atria produces one P wave. So, ECG will produce one P wave. Then there is a PR interval. Then there is a QRS complex. Then this QRS complex comes regularly that is called as sinus rhythm. Then if you take the uh, atrial fibrillation totally irregularly irregular uh, QRS complex you can see in the CCG and the baseline is wavy that means no traceable P waves and it is totally irregularly irregular. The QRS complex are coming totally irregularly irregular. Now, if you classify atrial fibrillation paroxysmal AF, persistent AF and permanent AF. Paroxysmal means episodes of AF uh, terminate spontaneously within 7 days. Most of these AFs will be transient, maybe 1 hour, 2 or less than 24 hours. Persistent means AF persists more than 7 days. Permanent AF means it is persisting more than 1 year. So, that is persistent, permanent and paroxysmal. Paroxysmal means acutely coming and disappearing fast. Now, if you see the atrial fibrillation causes, Whatever causes are there for tech, any type of tachyarrhythmia, here also it is applicable. So, it can be uh, non-cardiac and cardiac. Non-cardiac alcohol is the most common condition which produces atrial fibrillation. Then thyrotoxicosis, pulmonary embolism, hypoxemia, COPD. So, hypoxemia, alcohol and thyroid disorder. These are the three important things. Then cardiac most of the diseases of the heart which enlarges the atrium can produce atrial fibrillation like mitral valve disease, ischemic heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, congenital heart disease, uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, cardio cardiac failure, myocarditis. All these things can produce atrial fibrillation. Remember any condition which affects the atria will produce atrial fibrillation. Now, long atrial fibrillation whatever we have seen in the previous slide without any of these causes if the patient developing atrial fibrillation this is very common in elderly individual we will not be knowing what is the cause for atrial fibrillation so without any cause that is long atrial fibrillation 
it has primarily been applied to patient less than 60, 60 years of age but uh, uh, that the, the name for atrial lawn atrial fibrillation is if the age is less than 60 years but this type of lawn atrial fibrillations that you can see elderly individual we, we will not be able to find out any cause in routine examination but if you uh, do go for electrophysiological study and all you can see many abnormalities in the conduction system uh, but normal examination or normal ecg normal halter monitoring will not pick up any of these problems but detailed electrophysiological studies can pick up such patients have chart wask score of 0 that we will see afterwards what is this chart wask score symptoms patient can have palpitation syncope angina cardiac failure stroke and uh, without any clinical feature also patient can present that is subclinical F. The problem here is because of atrial fibrillation atria is not beating properly it is not getting contracted so blood stasis can occur there from there because of the stasis patient can develop embolic attacks from that uh, blood which is stas which is uh, which is uh, uh, developing clot there which can dislodge from there and go to ventricle and it can go to the systemic circulation the stroke is the most important problem in atrial fibrillation second thing is uh, since atrium is not contracting adequate blood will not go to the ventricle so that itself will reduce ejection fraction by 15 percent of the total ejection fraction so there is a reduction in the ejection fraction patient can develop hypotension if there is tachycardia then again diastolic time will come down again pumping will come down the cardiac failure will occur so tachycardia atrial fibrillation will produce hypotension and shock now clinical signs are very very important in atrial fibrillation we have already seen that irregularly irregular pulse so that is very important apical impulse and pulse there is a deficit you you can see the pulse is different when you are auscultating the apex and uh, simultaneously you are uh, uh, watching the pulse you can see there is a, def a defect bit deficit be between the apex and pulse this is called as pulse apex deficit or apex pulse deficit more than 10 beats varying intensity of first start sound that is because uh, the amount of blood coming to ventricle in each uh, cardiac cycle is different the uh, timing of the uh, 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 the cardiac cycle is varying in each uh, cycle so the pumping is different the uh, first start sound will be varying airway will be absent in jvp disappearance of pre systolic accentuation of mid diastolic murmur in the uh, mitral stenosis pre systolic accentuation in the mdm is due to the atrial booster kick at the end of the uh, uh, cycle atrium contracts and uh, remaining blood from the atrium may go to the ventricle uh, in the diastolic phase so that will be absent in atrial fibrillation so in a patient who is saying mitral stenosis pre systolic accentuation will be will not be there hypertension we have already explained in the last slide now ecg you can see here the most striking feature will be irregularly irregular QRS complex, wavy baseline. So, no P wave, irregularly irregular QRS complex, RR interval is varying, and most of the time, patient will have tachycardia. If you are treating, patient may develop uh, normal heart rate or bradycardia. Now, like uh, previously, we discussed some diseases can produce atrial fibrillation. So, you have to investigate the case like uh, you can do CKMB, troponin I, whether any ischemic heart disease is there or not, D-dimer if you are suspecting pulmonary embolism, thyroid function test if you are suspecting thyroid disease, chest x-ray if you are suspecting COPD, echo can be done to see whether any atrial dilatation is there or atrial mural thrombus is there, you can see uh, echo or transesophageal echo, halter can be done in uh, paroxysmal AF, then toxicology screening can be done to whether the patient has taken alcohol or not. Now complication we have seen already patient can have syncope, cardiac failure, pulmonary edema, angina, embolic stroke. Risk factors are age is a major risk factor because uh, whenever there is thromboembolism uh, uh, the age is main risk factor. Here also when there is a predisposing factor for thromboembolism like 
atrial fibrillation. So that is a major risk factor. Previous st uh, stroke or transient ischemic attack, mitral stenosis, hypertension, diabetes, cardiac failure, marked atrial enlargement, all these things are risk factor for uh, stroke in AF. Now management we will see in detail. Main thing is manage, manage the underlying cause that we have seen previously. Uh, then uh, the main idea of treatment in emergency room atrial fibrillation is control the rate, not to control the rhythm. To control the rhythm, we have to take the patient for cath lab or electrophysiology lab and we have to do something there. But in emergency room, our main target will be controlling the rhythm because the tachycardia in atrial fibrillation is producing all the complication uh, uh, in emergency room. So first one is to control the uh, rate, then the rhythm by a cardiologist. Third one will be prevention of stroke, embolic stroke. So these three things has to be done. Now controlling rate, you can use rate controlling drugs like metoprolol, diltiazem, verapamil or amidron or digoxin. So metoprolol, diltiazem, verapamil all are same type of drugs. They can control the rate when we are giving IV or oral tablets, we can control the rate. Only things, only thing, important thing is both metoprolol and diltiazem or verapamil, they are calcium channel blockers. They have to be used with caution in cardiac failure because they can reduce the cardiac output, they can reduce the cardiac pumping. So remember in hypotensive patients, we cannot use it. If the BP is good, then you can use it. BP is slightly low, you can go for amidron. There is cardiac failure, then digoxin will be a best choice. In hypotension and shock, the treatment is entirely different. We cannot use drugs there. So amidron is a very good drug when the BP is slightly low. But uh, uh, when the BP is good, we should not use. We can use beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Uh, and if the patient is resistant to beta blocker and calcium channel blocker also, we can go for amidron. The dose is 150 milligram over 10 minutes, 15 mg per minute, then 1 mg per minute for 6 hours, then 0.5 mg per minute, then oral tablets. There are some side effects for uh, amidron that has to be taken care. Dorenderone is another alternative for amidron, but uh, uh, that is not available everywhere. So we must learn about amidron infusion. Digoxin is one important drug can be used in patients who is having atrial fibrillation with cardiac failure. That is very important because a patient who is having atrial fibrillation without cardiac failure never use digoxin because digoxin has got lot of adverse effects. If there is strong benefit for digoxin, we have to use it. Otherwise, we should not use digoxin because the adverse effects are very, very high when we are using digoxin. But if there is cardiac failure with atrial fibrillation, the best choice will be digoxin because it improves the pumping, it reduces the heart rate, it can control the rate, it can improve the cardiac output. Anticoagulation is very important in atrial fibrillation because we have already learned that uh, the, in atrial fibrillation, atria is not pumping properly, so there will be blood stasis and clot formation there. So you can use heparin in acute settings and warfarin for a long term therapy, aspirin can be added to the therapy. When we are starting heparin, APTT should be kept in 45 to 60 seconds or you can, if you do not want to monitor APTT, better go for or you are not able to monitor APTT, better to go for low molecular weight heparin 1 mg per kg BD dose. So that also can be used. Along with heparin, we have to start warfarin because warfarin takes nearly 7 days to act, to get its peak action. So slowly warfarin can be, uh, uh, warfarin, warfarin acts very slowly. So warfarin should be started along with heparin and after one week we can stop the heparin and continue warfarin for a longer period and the INR should be kept 2 to 3. That is very important. There are some other drugs which can be re, which can which can replace warfarin, which has got lesser side effects uh, than warfarin. No need to monitor the drug like dabigatra and nevaroxiban, apixiban. All these things are there. If there is a bleeding tendency, we have uh, reversal agents for uh, dabigatra and apixiban, uh, so that can be used. Whereas in uh, warfarin, if there is a bleeding tendency, we have to use uh, 
vitamin K and FFP here uh, we have other drugs Idarizumab uh, 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 can be used in uh, dabigatran and uh, adnexa that can be used in that is recombinant coagulation factor 10a can be used in apixaban now this is chart vast score i am not going to the details of this depending on this score you can uh, uh, plan your uh, uh, risk stratification in atrial fibrillation anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation everything is given in this chart i am not going to the details of this chart vast score but if you are treating this patient according to the score it will be a standardized protocol now restoring sinus rhythm is the secondary problem in uh, uh, atrial fibrillation primary problem will be tachycardia that should be controlled with the drugs that we discussed previously then prevent the embolism that uh, we can use heparin or warfarin or other newer drugs now second thing is pharmacological control of the rhythm so there are some drugs like ibutilide uh, uh, dofetilide plicanide propofol all these things but there is an advantage of amiodarone amiodarone if you are starting it can control both the rate and rhythm so if possible in a patient who is uh, having tachycardia with atrial fibrillation and you do not have a, a proper cardiology setup or you do not have a electrophysiological setup if you start amiodarone you can control both the rate and rhythm in most of the cases not in all cases uh, most of the cases you can control the rate and rhythm with amiodarone so amiodarone is a very useful drug we should learn uh, all details about amiodarone when we are treating atrial fibrillation now electrical uh, rate, uh, rate and rhythm control is the next option so for that we have to learn about dc cardioversion we will not be able to tell about dc cardioversion here because uh, there is a hands on training uh, process dc cardioversion should be trained in all uh, for all healthcare professionals because atrial fibrillation those who are working in er so atrial fibrillation is a condition where there is tachycardia and patient develops hypotension shock or altered behavior reduced uh, perfusion to internal organs so any type of uh, uh, compromised circulation we have to give dc cardioversion so dc cardioversion should be given uh, to control the rate and rhythm restoring the uh, sinus rhythm before that you have to sedate the patient you can give midazolam then before that you have to anticoagulate the patient if possible you can use heparin then warfarin and you can do it as elective process in a, in, a, in your ccu or you can do it as an emergency process in the emergency room uh, both this condition you have to sedate the patient properly because it's a painful process process so urgent cardioversion is required in active ischemia evidence of organ hyperperfusion severe manifestation of heart failure presence of pre excitation syndrome like wpw syndrome so any unstable patient who is having atrial fibrillation or even uh, supraventricular tachycardia you have to cardiovert the patient you cannot use the drugs like beta blocker calcium channel blocker all these things because that itself will produce further hypotension and all so uh, dc cardioversion is the treatment of choice now radio frequency ablation should be done by a cardiologist in uh, electrophysiology cath lab so that will stop the unwanted uh unwanted foci of uh, electrical uh, production in the heart so we can control the rhythm and rate by this radio frequency ablation so we have discussed about one of the most common tachyarrhythmias in emergency room that is atrial fibrillation the problem in atrial fibrillation is irregularly irregular rhythm tachycardia atria is not pumping properly that produces stasis of the blood and uh, hypercoagulation and thrombus formation stroke other ischemic problems the contraction of the atria is completely uh, uh, absent so the ejection fraction from the ventricle also will come down it can produce hypotension tachycardia again produces re reduced diastolic time and uh, re reduction in the cardiac pumping that also produces hypotension so 
three major things in atrial fibrillation is first one is control the rate second thing is prevention of the embolic attacks third one is restoring sinus rhythm but if the patient is coming in an emergency who is having tachyarrhythmia hypotension or altered behavior electrical cardioversion is the treatment of choice thank you